want to share with you a little bit about my story and my journey over the past six years and uh, tell you a little bit about Generosity Water and how we started and what we're doing. And uh, for me, I've always been a little bit of an entrepreneur. I mean, when I was like 13 years old, I was the kid, you know, I mean, my friends would be reading, you know, Twilight or Harry Potter, but I was the kid reading Donald Trump's The Art of the Deal at like 13 years old. You know, I don't know why. I just loved it. I'd be like, I'd be glued to it. And uh, so I've always wanted to be a business person and start businesses. And so my first business, I was 13. I went to downtown Los Angeles, you know, born and raised out here. And we found this little vendor that was selling laser pointers, you know, like, like this one here, if it works, like that. But uh, it was like these little ones that we, we were able to negotiate. And we, we got them for a dollar each. And I, I went home, I took pictures of them, and I sold them on eBay for $6 each. So I went, I, I went and I literally took my life savings of like $100, I was 13, and I went and I bought 100 laser pointers and I sold them all within about 30 days on eBay for $6 each. But of course I had to like use my dad's eBay account because I wasn't old enough to do it. Um, so I had to like give him a little kickback, you know, it's fine. Um, but, but then we, uh, I started doing this every single month. I'd go back and buy another 100 and sell them. And, and so then pretty soon we started getting people emailing us saying, uh, you know, I want to buy a thousand of these laser pointers for our whole company. Can you put our logo on it? And, you know, people thought they were doing business with like a grown up, you know? So people would, would, they would call me and I'd put on a deep voice. They'd be like, global sales, this is Jordan. And they were like, oh, what are you, a college student? I'm like 13 years old. This is no joke. So I've always just been, you know, doing these little businesses. And pretty soon we started importing laser pointers from China and importing them by the pallet and would start selling them across the country. And my dad and my mom were both incredibly supportive of me and like a part of us on this journey, they would co-sign at the dock, you know, when everything would come in and, and we would, uh, you know, we start shipping stuff out. And so it was, just, it was a fun business, but for like a 13 year old, I was making a couple thousand dollars every month and that was like incredible. And, uh, but then I went into high school and in high school I played, played basketball and, and yeah, like stopped doing this business. And uh, I just kind of, you know, hung out with friends and just pursued my high school life. But then when I was 18 years old, uh, I decided to get back into business, and so I got my real estate license. And I was kind of an old graduate, like I graduated when I was 19, so my whole senior year I was 18. And I left school at noon, because I did like five classes and left at noon, and went home and worked for a real estate company. It was like doing mortgages and loans and this whole thing, and pretty quickly became a top salesperson for this company, and had made over $100,000 before I graduated from high school. And so for me, I was incredibly motivated by business and by money. And it started to impact my life. Like I wanted the nicest things and I thought I was on top of the world and I bought like a Mercedes and I would just, I mean, I was just this guy that like was genuinely concerned and, and motivated by how much money I could make. And I started my own real estate and mortgage company pretty soon after that. And we started making a lot of money and, and doing some really incredible things. But then in 2007, the uh, real estate and mortgage industry completely tanked and just crashed. And I went from literally having six figures in my bank account to not even being able to pay my rent the next month in about nine months time. And I remember sitting on my balcony, incredibly like depressed and frustrated and embarrassed and thinking, how did, I, how did this happen? Like, how did I go from having all this money and this success to having nothing? And I remember having this conversation with my dad and he was just, he was saying, hey, you know, we're, my dad's a pastor of a church, by the way, in LA. So it's kind of strange that uh, I grew up being such a business person motivated by money and he's over here helping people and, and preaching to people. Somehow it just didn't click for me, I guess. But uh, my parents have been incredible influences in my life. And they said, hey, well, we're doing this thing in Africa with some orphanages and whatnot. Why don't you go and just visit one of these orphanages in these schools and see some, some people in East Africa? And so at the time, I was kind of nervous about what Africa was going to be like. This was in 2008, and I was 21 years old. I was excited, and it's an adventure, and I was excited for it. But at the same time, was, I mean, everything I had seen from documentaries and movies was kind of either guns and war or extreme poverty and depression. And I thought, you know, are people just going to have the flies in the eyes everywhere, and it's going to be really sad? And, um, but I decided to go on this trip, and... I was shocked when I got off the plane and we started going to these communities and these, and these places and we saw quite the opposite of what I had expected. I went there expecting to see this extreme poverty and sadness, but what I saw was actually some of the most happy and inspiring kids. If I see my clicker, I don't think is working here. Okay, can we, can maybe you can just control the slides back there. That's fine with me. There we go. 
So these are some of the kids, and I brought a camera with me, and we went to Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya on this first trip, and I spent about a month there, and literally spent time with people that were too poor to eat and were too poor to drink clean water. And despite owning nothing, they had so much joy and so much happiness, and in this moment, I realized the difference of ownership versus possession. You see, you can own everything, but possess no faith, no joy, because to possess is to use what you have. And these people possess such a joy and such a faith that it truly inspired me. Um, I've been to church buildings that were massive in size, but was completely lifeless on the inside. And I've also been to some churches in Haiti and in Ethiopia where they're meeting in shacks and in tents, but there's so much energy and so much faith that is truly inspiring. And this, this little girl right here, she knew she was cute. You know, she would just kind of jump in front of the camera everywhere I went, and, and it was beautiful. Like, we could, show these, we could show them their photos on the back of the camera, and a lot of these people had never seen their photos before. It was the first time, and so they would just start laughing and hitting each other, and it was a really funny moment. But these same beautiful children with smiles and futures were spending hours every single day walking for water with these jerry cans. And these ones would weigh maybe 15 to 20 pounds full of water, but some of the bigger ones could weigh up to 45 pounds. And they would walk three miles every day in search of water. This one woman here is carrying three of them, one on her head and one in each hand. And she was a mom of about six children. And this was in Uganda. We went to this community called Peche Village. And these women are walking to sources that are so dirty that you would never even let your pets drink this water, let alone a human being. And when I started to see this, it really started to break my heart. I remember I had a, mo a moment out there with God where I just started to cry. And I thought, all these problems that I thought I had back home, all these you know, insecurities and ambitions that I had in my own life meant nothing compared to some of the issues and the problems that people are facing in our world. And looking back, I truly thank God for the experience that I've had going from success to failure because if it wasn't for that humbling experience, my life would be in such a different place in such a different direction. I really feel like God used that experience to show me what truly matters in life and what is, is truly meaningful. And, and I felt like God was speaking to my heart saying, I did give you a gift in business and I did give you a gift to create, but it's not about you. It's so that you can actually make a difference in the world and help people and use your gift to make a difference in the world. And so I was thinking to myself, okay, this, is a, this was that community, Peche Village, and they have a really interesting story. This was in 2001. More than half the population of the community before we got there had passed away from a cholera outbreak in the water. Half the population. It was about 800 people in the village. 400 people died one month before we got there. There were still burial sites, and people were mourning and grieving. It was a really, truly sad time. And this isn't the case everywhere. I'm not saying that every village we went to, you know, half the people died, but this one was extreme. And they, you know, they were saying to us that we could build a well in this community that would cost about $5,000 and would provide everyone with clean water. And they were explaining that if you guys got here a month ago and we built this well, 400 people could still be alive. And so I'm thinking, for $5,000, 400 people died. I mean, that's less than $10 a person. People are dying because of $10. I mean, for us, that's rather inexpensive. And if that issue was ever happening to people we know, we could solve it before any problem ever, ever came. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to come home, and I'm still broke for my real estate stuff. So I'm going to come home, and I'm going to ask all my friends and family, and this was around November, so I was like, instead of giving me a Christmas gift, would you guys donate something? We didn't even have an organization yet, but I was like, would you donate something? We'll put it in a pot, and we'll go back to Peche Village, and we'll build a clean water well for these people. And it, was, it just blew me away. People that definitely wouldn't even have given me a gift donated something and contributed, and we started putting all this together, and pretty soon we raised over $6,000, and we went back to Peche Village. We, we partnered with a local organization in Uganda, and we built our very first well in this community. And you know, people went from drinking water like this to celebrating and splashing under fresh, clean drinking water. And we started researching and learning more and more about this issue and realizing that this isn't just an issue that was affecting you know, Uganda or small pockets, but it's actually affecting almost 1.1 billion people at the time. And this was in 2008. 
Since then, the number has now dropped down to about 768 million people that still today don't have access to clean water. And although this is a massive number, I'm truly inspired, though, by the fact that when we started this, it was 1.1 billion people, and now today, it's 768 million. So I like to think that Generosity Water has played a part in this solution and in helping people. And of course, there's been dozens of other organizations and there's been a lot of other people that have been speaking out about this issue and together we're actually seeing change happen. I remember that when people would, would, uh, would tell me, oh, that's cool that you built the well, but like this issue is never going to go away. It's been around forever. I mean, there's no way this is ever going to be solved in our lifetime. And that, that has always stuck with me that there were, for so long, people always thought this is never going to change. And I always think about any major issue in the history of humanity people thought was impossible until somebody decided to say that it wasn't impossible. And for us, we just decided, okay, we may not be able to help the entire world overnight. We may not be able to give every single person clean water tomorrow, but we can definitely help one person at a time. We can help one community, one family, and maybe their lives can be changed, and maybe they can go to school and get an education and come back and bring change to their community. So not only is this uh, 768 million people don't have clean water, but it's actually the largest cause of death and disease in the world today, more than war, AIDS, and famine combined. And the United Nations says that more than half of the world's hospital beds are filled with patients affected by water-related diseases. Now, obviously, that's not the case here in Los Angeles, but globally, more than half of the world's hospital beds are affected by people with water-related diseases. So for us... uh, And one other thing is that every $1 invested into clean water projects results in $8 in economic growth. And I thought this was such a fascinating thing. If we're talking about solving problems and helping these countries out of poverty, the best economical investment into the developing nations is clean water. Every $1 invested is $8 in economic growth, and I'll explain why. See, water is the first step to breaking the cycle of extreme poverty. And we didn't want to build more schools in communities if we first weren't stopping the reason why kids couldn't go to school, because kids were walking for hours every single day, and a lot of these kids would have to drop out and either work or collect water for their families. And as we just said, more than half the world's hospital beds are filled with patients affected by water-related diseases, so we didn't want to build more hospitals if we weren't stopping the reason why people were going there in the first place. So for us, water was not only the first step to breaking the cycle of poverty, but the best economical investment into a developing country. And so over the past six years now, we've, uh, since 2008, we've been able to raise over $4 million and build 550 water projects in 19 different countries, which is now giving clean water to over 325,000 people. And Generosity Water was started with a very simple idea and a very simple mission. And we started in one community, but then we've seen hundreds and hundreds of people get involved and use their voice to create change. And I've been truly inspired by the thousands of people that have given. Like, I might have raised $5,000 or $6,000 to build a well, but now we've seen millions of dollars come through because people sacrificed, they gave, and they were generous. And I'm going to share a little bit about some people who have done some incredible things. But first, there's a a story in the Bible that really sticks out to me. And a lot of you guys would know it. Uh, In Luke chapter 19, verse 1, is the story of Zacchaeus. And if you're not familiar with it, Zacchaeus, obviously a, a tax collector who was a crook, who was very wealthy, very successful, very smart, but would cheat people out of their money and was known for his greed and for his wealth. And he was also a really small guy. And so he, was, he heard about Jesus, and he didn't really know much about him other than that he was potentially the Savior, potentially changed people's lives. So he wanted to get a glimpse of who Jesus was. And so Zacchaeus climbed up to a tree to just get a glimpse of Jesus as he walked by. And when Jesus walked by, he saw Zacchaeus hiding up in the tree, and he asked him to come down. And he actually invited Zacchaeus, or he asked Zacchaeus, I want to go and dine with you in your house. And this was like a shock to everybody else watching. I mean, like Jesus, this holy man, this savior wants to hang out with a crook that we all know took our money and like slandered. And I mean, just a terrible human being. Why would Jesus, there's so many people here. Why does he choose this crook? 
And then all of a sudden, when Jesus goes over to his house, Zacchaeus gladly welcomes him in. I love what it says in the Bible because it doesn't give much description, but it says, all the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. And what I love here is that after an encounter with Jesus, the natural reaction of Zacchaeus was an eruption of generosity. I love that this man who was known for his greed encountered Jesus and erupted with generosity. He couldn't help it. But then not only to pay back four times of what he stole, but to give half of his possessions away. And to me, I believe that it's truly impossible to encounter the love and the grace of God and not be a generous human being and not be generous with our time, with our love, with our money, with our resources. Because when we follow God, we know that it's like his love and his resources are limitless. So why would we withhold from what he's given to us so freely. And for me, I came back from these trips to Africa and, this, and started to realize that I was living a life similar in a sense that I was becoming very greedy and motivated by money as opposed to motivated by people. And so I committed the, the last six years of my life dedicating it to making a difference in people's lives by starting a business, by creating something that could actually have meaningful change in the world as opposed to just making money and making a profit. And what's been so inspiring to me is we've had, like I was just saying, some of the, like, some amazing people. We created this website called mygenerositywater.com where people were creating fundraising pages and doing all kinds of stuff. And these little nine-year-old kids, uh, oh, we just skipped it. That's not a nine-year-old kid. <laughs> well, I don't know where it went, but there was these nine-year-old kids that they started a bake sale and they, they sold cookies and they, I mean, until they raised about $5,000 to build a well in, in Africa. And then we had someone like Katy Perry who heard about Generosity Water and wanted to dedicate a part of her tour dates to raising money for Generosity Water and donated profits and this whole thing. And so in a matter of months, she raised over $43,000 for Generosity Water. Oh, here's the kids. It was reversed. So these kids right here, they raised over $5,000 to build a well through just some bake sales. And these girls here are part of a sorority at University of Arizona, and they threw a basketball tournament, and they raised $15,000 in one day to build three more wells around the world. And it was just something as simple as throwing a basketball tournament and asking people to get involved. And so to me, I've been inspired by the creativity in people. And I never could have imagined where we would have gone, but people have been generous and creative and inspiring. And Generosity Water was never built on the gifts and talents of a few people, but truly on the hard work and the sacrifice and the generosity of many people. And it's, it's inspiring for me to sit back and watch what God is doing here with this organization and with people around the world. And uh, I just wanted to close and share with you one story that truly might be one of the great moments that I've ever had in my life. And this last year, about a, uh, about a year and a half ago, actually, we went to Haiti and he mentioned when he was reading a little bit about my bio, there was a film that we produced called La Source, and it was a documentary about a janitor who grew up in Haiti, and his, his community didn't have access to clean water, no school, no health clinic, and he got a job as a janitor at Princeton University where he's worked for the last 18 years, and so he gave half of his income to his family and trying to help them with water, help them with basic things. It's been his lifelong goal to bring clean water to his village. But because he's a janitor, he never really had enough money Make any, build a well or do anything like that. And this was before the earthquake when we heard about him. And then the earthquake happened and everyone on Princeton campus knew Joe Swee and knew his story. And literally a movement happened on Princeton where thousands of people went to these concerts, sacrificed meals, and they raised money and they gave towards Joe Swee's water project in Haiti. And it raised over $35,000 and built this massive project in, in his village and truly inspiring. And so we used this film and we screened it all over the place and we were trying to raise awareness about Haiti and trying to raise more money for this country and for, for water wells there. And on our trip back to Haiti, when we were scouting, okay, where do we want to build these wells? You know, wh- where is the most need here in Haiti? We went to this, this community about two hours outside of Port-au-Prince. 
and we cl- it was up in the mountains, and we kind of climbed up, and we met this woman named Elisil, and Elisil was in her 70s, and she, you could tell just by the look in her, in her face that she had lived a long, meaningful life. Like, she just, her face just spoke volumes. You could see it in her eyes that she was like a mother, a grandmother to this whole community, and we started talking to her about why we were there and what our mission was and what we wanted to do, and she told us that for her whole life, her community had never had access to clean water before. That she had walked for miles every single day, carrying a jerry can either on her head or on her back, and she would walk for these miles up to the spring source and walk back down to her community. And so we asked her, we told her, well, we're, we're here looking for a story to tell so that we could go and we can show this in dozens of universities and churches and businesses, and we want to tell your story and inspire people to give so that we can build water projects here in Haiti. And she looked at us and she said, you know, a lot of people have promised us that. A lot of people have promised us that they're going to build a water project here, and nobody has. So she said, if you're going to promise this to us, you better, you better deliver on it, basically, is what she was saying. And we looked at her in the eye, and we said, Elise, like, we are going to build you a well here. And we, not only do we want to build a well in your village, but we want to build a well in 19 other communities around you here in Haiti, and we want you to be a spokesperson for us. And as, not even for us, a spokesperson for Haiti and for people here. And so she agreed. And so she she a water source where she, uh, where she collected water. And it was pretty fascinating that on this journey... Here we are with a 72-year-old woman, and she's walking two miles. And I'm thinking to myself, my grandmother's about that age, and I could not imagine her walking up two miles up a hill in Haiti in the hot heat. And we get up there, and she fills up her water without even hesitating, puts it on her head, and starts walking back down to her house. And my buddy Jake was with me, and he was filming, and we're, kind of, we're filming, and I have nothing in my hands, and we're filming her walk down with, with you know, this 40-pound this bucket of water on her head, and we're kind of thinking to ourselves, like, wow, this is a great story. I'm so glad that we're, uh, we're capturing this. But at the same time, I feel kind of weird as a human being that's in my 20s watching a 70-year-old woman walk down the mountain with this huge jerry can on her head, and I'm not carrying anything. So the human side of us was like, okay, let's put down the camera for a second, and let's like, help her carry this down. So we, uh, we take the jerry can off of her head, and she's like, she ins- insisted, though, like she didn't want to let us, t- like because in their culture, women carried the water, so for her, it was so we, did, we agreed that we would walk, carry it down together instead of just her. So we, she had a hand on the bucket, and I had a hand on the bucket. And we started walking down this mountain back to her community. And it was a really beautiful moment because I could just see us walking down together, and we kind of look at each other. We never spoke the same language, so we can, couldn't really communicate. But we didn't need to. Everything that was needed to be said was just said through or I guess our looks. And so we, we walked down, and she looked at us in the eye, and, and the translator was there, and, and she said to us, toi et moi. And in French Creole, what that meant was you and I. And what she was saying, and her translator explained it, what she was saying is that you and I are going to bring change to this community. It's you and I together that's going to bring change. And this really stuck out to me, because from, the, from day one, it's never been about us helping them. It's never been about us, let let us come in and show you what you need to do and let us build the well for you. It's really been like, how can we come alongside you and help fund this project and train leaders here to manage and equip this project for sustainability and to last for for decades? How can we work with these people? And what, what inspired me about her words is that I truly believe that real change always starts with a you and I mindset. How can we do this together? And... So we, we, we captured her story, and we literally shared it for more than 20,000 people around the world. It was, we did film festivals, and we did universities, and businesses, and churches, and conferences, and anywhere we could. And we shared her story with people, and she boldly was an amazing representative and a spokesperson, not only for the need for water, but for people in Haiti. And... We, uh, this campaign over the next six months raised over $130,000 and it built the 20 water projects in Haiti. And so last year in August, we had the opportunity to go back to Haiti to go and visit the completed projects. And we took about 15 people with us, people that had raised money and given and been a part of the journey. And we went to her community and we were asking around, is Elisil here? Like, we can't wait to see her and like, you know, show her that we, we honored our commitment to you. Like, we, we did this well, like, we want to see you. And house and she wasn't there. And we saw her son who was up there 
And her son was saying to us, she's really sick. She's staying with my brother. She has asthma. She's you know, struggled with this her whole life. And so she's staying with, with my brother. So we went to her brother's house and she was resting. And so we didn't want to wake her up. And I was talking to her brother and he was like, no, 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 no. Like, she's going to remember you. I want to, I want to go get her. So she comes out of her little house and we start talking and I could just sense the pain in her voice and in her body. And you know, she's in her seventies. They don't have the best medical care. And I didn't know how much longer she had to live. I didn't know if it was a week, a month, a year, or what. But I could just, I mean, she would cough every, every few seconds, and she, would just, she was way slower. She wasn't the same that she was before. And I just wanted in this moment to let her know that her story mattered, that her voice mattered, that, that she not only helped her community get water, but because she was bold enough and courageous enough to use her voice 20 communities and over 10,000 people in Haiti now have clean water because of her, her, her voice and her effort. And so I just tried to share that with her, and I could just see the look in her face that she understood what I was saying, and she was grateful that we came back. And in that moment, her toi et moi truly resonated with my heart, because if it wasn't for her, if it wasn't for the people in the U.S. that raised the money working together, these projects would have never happened. And that's, like, this, this moment was truly one of the most remarkable moments of my life, and I'll never forget it. Um, and my encouragement today is to not let your voice go silent, is to use your voice to create change. And I just want you to know that it doesn't matter how small you think your platform might be or how big it might be, that your voice matters and that people will listen and that together we can create extraordinary change around the world. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.